mortal words of Monty Python now for something completely different. So I'm going to be talking about a topic that has been, I think, very well covered um, during this conference, maybe from a slightly different angle. But as I like gear, I particularly like history, I'm going to start off with some history and hopefully draw a correlation to what I'm talking about a little bit down the line. So um, there's lots of people that I'd you know, like to thank, everyone at Thor, and some people that I've worked with for a long time. And it's been a, an incredible journey for me to, um, to learn what I have. And my, my interest in, in shock is directly related to my time in the military and the, the number of soldiers that die, about 91% of them die from preventable death of hemorrhagic shock. And that's driven my interest. So um, <clears throat> we've been delivering care for a long time. So this is a uh, this is a pottery from uh, ancient Greece, and this is showing the Battle of Troy. And you can, you can see a, a soldier being bandaged, uh, bandaged there. It's uh, Achilles, um, so Brad Pitt. And then uh, in slightly more recent times, we've got uh, you know, modern conflicts, and we've been doing things. We've been doing things to try to help people. A lot of innovation has been driven by war. Um, some of the things that we've done have helped, and some of the things that we've done have harmed. And this is kind of like what I'm trying to talk about. So successful, you know, we can be successful in our procedures, but we may not always be successful in our outcomes. So um, there is a drive to do something, right? So, uh, so this is Hippocrates. He's been around for, uh, for a long time, and uh, through the ages, there's something that has been ubiquitous in medical care for probably about four and at least four and a half thousand years, and that is we bled people. Right? That is what physicians did. No matter what you, was wrong with you, we even bled people for bleeding, right? if you can believe that. Right? And um, all the way up to actually the 19th century and the invention of modern photography, we were still bleeding people. So how did we manage to do this procedure for so long without stopping? Right? And this is what, kind of what, what I'd like to talk about. So, and the reason is, right, is we've got two differences here. If... A, an intervention is performed and you survive, then the physician immediately claims uh, the credit for that. Um, and then if the patient dies, it's obviously died because he had non-survivable injury or illness. And this is, this is kind of ubiquitous. So, so like uh, Louis XIV was bled over a thousand times. And obviously the ailments that caused him, right, he recovered from, and that was due to the skill in bleeding of his personal physician. But this is George Washington. Right? He was critically ill, probably septic, and they removed two and a half liters of his circulating volume. Right? So of all the American presidents that needed two and a half liters removing from their blood volume, I would say he wasn't the right guy. Probably <laughs> a more modern candidate either I would have chosen. So, um, but, but right, so, so, so when we, we have something I refer to as iatrogenic blindness. We are blind in medicine to the harm that we do. And, uh, and, I, and I think that, that this continues, has always been, and it still continues. And we, we have to, we ha I mean, the, the rise of evidence-based medicine has tried to address this. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So doing something in modern times, anybody know what this is? Anybody like to hazard a guess? <laughs> well done, sir. You obviously <laughs> you got some interesting hobbies. Um, <laughs> so, 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 so they stationed these along the Thames, right? And uh, and then if somebody fell into the river and drowned, they were hauled out, and then you you blew pipe smoke up somebody's ass, right? So, um, you know, and uh, anybody know who this gentleman is? Right? No, Bell. Sorry. All right. Yeah, he he he's a Nobel laureate for medicine. Amazing procedure he invented, the frontal lobotomy, right? And even more modern times, we've got clear fluids. So I, you know, I was trained up in the 80s, and I used to pride myself that I could like pressure infuse six liters of crystalloid into my patients before they got to hospital. So and 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 uh, and just like everybody before us, and just like the bleeding, we suffer from that iatrogenic blindness. So. What's the problem? So, as we have more, as we've entered the enlightenment, we've started to realize the harm that we do in trying to do good, and it's uh, it's 
it doesn't sit very well in the conscious. And that is and that has led to like the gold what's called the golden rule of medicine that I don't have to explain this to anyone. But so often this is forgotten, right? First do no harm. And uh and uh, I'd like to talk a little bit uh about how we decide to do that. Because now we have two contradicting things. We want to do good and we want to do no harm, right? And this is a balance, and it's a very delicate balance. And we have to try and negotiate this every single time we treat a patient. So we have to use clinical judgment. And um, this is the hardest thing to train. So you, you can have guidelines, and guidelines are often wrong, as Giz just spoke about. So we have to try, we have to sometimes look beyond guidelines, and we have to sometimes use other tools, and, and how do we do this clinical gu judgment, right? So. Um, if you want to do no harm, you have to be very conservative in your approach. And if you want to do something, and you, you and I have to be more aggressive. So it's this balance. When should we be aggressive and jump in and do something? And when should we, when we should, should we be more conservative? So uh, down to judgment, right? So this is just a model that I like to use. So how can we do this? Right? And I like this uh, Venn diagram because there's overlap. So we, ha we have um, physiology, we've got evidence, we've got experience, and we've got reason. And we need all of them. And the reason that we need all of them is everyone's like, yeah, evidence-based medicine, that's the only way to go. And yet, when we've got world experts standing up there, everyone says almost the same thing. The evidence is poor. So we cannot just utilize evidence. We have to back evidence up with understanding of physiology as best as we can at the moment. And we have to actually look what works. So there's a, there's a great paper about... Um, the, the you know uh, double blinding ra randomized control study on parachute use right so so we <laughs> you know we, like there's never been an RCT right so that means you shouldn't use a parachute uh, parachute and what the point that they're trying to make is that the observational power of experimentation and doing what works has to be considered and then we have to things have to be reasonable so if you can tick more of these. The more of these, the more of these Venn diagrams that you have overlap on, then the more aggressive you can be. And the less of them that you can tick, probably the more conservative you should be. And so you can use this as a tool to work out where, where you should lie. And um, if you are aggressive and you have a lot of these bases covered, I think that you will have a successful procedure or a successful intervention and a successful outcome. But if you, are, if, you have, if you are aggressive and you don't have many of these covered, I think that you have successful procedure and unsuccessful outcome. Right, so, sure, everybody's seen this photo. Okay. So, how should we treat this patient? Right, so, this is pretty much what I'm going to talk about. I like to give a, takes, a case study to kind of, and make it real, to make it visceral. Right? So. I'm sure everybody would probably use some kind of a strategy, structured approach, whether it's march if you're military, whether it's CABCDE, might just be ABCDE. Probably a lot of people would start off with the blood that's flowing out. And the reason that this guy's probably still conscious is that somebody's holding uh, one of his arteries um, closed off in his hand. And then we'd move on to airway and breathing and then back to circulation. So I would like to think that probably this would go through almost everybody's head here. And this is what I'd like to look at, right? So aggressive use of tourniquets. Well, you know, this is not the main focus of my talk, and I'll be talking in the workshop a little bit about it. But, you know, I would like to argue that there is, you know, that we have, we have, uh, and we understand the physiology of using tourniquets very well. Um, we have now lots of published data from the, from the, Conflicts from recent conflicts, you know, we have experience and, you know, in personal experience and experience of everybody that I talk to, if they are applied properly, they work and they save life and it stands to reason. So when you can tick off all of these things, you know, what you have here is an aggressive approach, right? But you have a successful procedure with a successful outcome. And um, my next thing is where maybe the controversy will start, right? Positive, RSI and positive pressure ventilation in hemorrhagic shock. So, we got this guy. Can we be aggressive? Can we be aggressive with uh, RSI, pre-hospital anesthesia, and uh, 
and uh, positive pressure ventilation once we've induced anesthesia. So, here's a question. You are the receiving clinician of this casualty. Show of hands. Who here would RSI this guy? One. Only one. Two. Okay. I'll make it slightly more challenging. This guy deteriorates on his way to you. And he gets to you and he is now unresponsive to pain stimulus. Now, who would RSI this guy? He's got bilateral amputations, catastrophic hemorrhage, and he's unresponsive. Who would RSI the guy? So it's five or six. Actually, not that many. So, Well, <laughs> this is what I'd like to talk about because a lot of the speakers uh, that we've had you know, have, uh, have uh, pretty much um, discussed quite aggressive approaches to RSI. So, so let's talk about that. And I'm going to talk about each of these fears and look at a couple of things and then kind of draw a conclusion. So let's look at the physiology. So what's our definition of shock? Gears covered some of this. So it is when the delivery of oxygen is a mismatch between delivery and consumption. And we have global cellular hypoxia. Then we have a lot of associated pathologies. And it's not just these, it's a lot more. Turns out shock is very, very complicated. But we must remember that the driver of almost all of these are both the tissue injury and the associated oxygen debt and the blood failure as Gear spoke about. So, if the problem here in shock is DO2, I'd like to take a little bit of a closer look at DO2. So Gears put this in here. I just want to double tap it to make sure everybody's tracking here. So, so you can see that we have point of injury, and as our DO2 drops, we have no drop in VO2, right? Until we hit critical DO2, and then we have decompensation. What happens to our lactate? Well, that's almost the inverse. So because we have no drop in VO2 until we hit critical DO2, these two path. And this is why right, we use tools to check for metabolic acidosis almost as a definition for shock. How, how, can, how can this work? How can it, well, basically our oxygen extraction ratio increases and then our venous. So we're just pulling more of the magic molecule. We're pulling more oxygen out of the blood. Quite important. By definition, when you go over the edge of this cliff, right, and you are generating oxygen debt, you are hypoperfused, and that is why this is happening. You are hypoxic, but you have glo systemic global hypoxia, and you are developing acidosis. And if you remember, one of the previous talks talked about the, what um, what's his name uh, Scott Weingott calls the hop. The hop killers, there we have the hop killers for RSI, right? right there, by definition in shock. Okay, so, but the problem here is DO2. So what I'd like to do is talk about um, that in a little bit more detail. So Gears covered some of this as well. So DO2 is this equation, and there's only three variables. So if shock is this drop in DO2 to where it passes critical DO2, then we must... If we're going to do something about this, we must understand these three variables, and this is where it all takes part. So let's look at cardiac output, because in shock, cardiac output is the problem. So cardiac output has to equal venous return, right? It is, it, that is axiomatic, right? The heart can only pump out what it gets back in. And um, here's, a, here's a diagram. It actually turns out that uh, venous return is horrendously comp uh, complicated, um, but there's some, there's some agreement. I'm going uh, to simplify it slightly onto what people agree with. And uh, here the, the conclusion is that venous return and preload are the problem, right? And now we know that what we're looking at, just to remember like that, uh, that equation, if you were wondering what those, what those items were and, and what the numbers were. So we need to look at venous return and have a little bit of an understanding of venous return, right? So that's Guyton in the top right-hand corner that uh, Gail was looking at as well. He did a lot of the primary work in the 50s on venous return. 
and um, and uh, uh, Venus return, it turns out, is is, is actually it's, it's quite controversial, and not not all the physi physiologists agree, and it's uh, complex, almost beyond measure, and uh, and they they in 2006 they had a big conference to try and work out some balance between all these opposing views and whatever. But I'm going to present some of the things that people agree on, right? So the problem, particularly in um, in shock, is that we lose our volume. As everybody knows, so our circulating volume is falling out. It's a thing. We're getting less back in, right? So there are compensatory mechanisms. So that is the main driver. That's our problem: is we've lost volume, and then that is reducing venous return. So, so we have to look at how can we compensate. So obviously, there's uh, we can increase systemic vascular resistance. One of the other main compensatory mechanisms, and one of the great effectors of venous return is the respiratory pump. We also then have the musco. Um, the musco-venous pump, right, and uh, venous res uh, resistance, as I said. So, so we'll look at a couple of graphs here. So this is the pressure inside the inside the vascular system, and you can see it's obviously very high on the arterial side and very low at the at the at the venous side, right. So, so it doesn't show because this is just the vasculature, the lowest point, the lowest pressure in the entire system is in the right atrium, and that is zero. Right? So that's at zero pressure above atmospheric pressure. So it turns out it takes very little pressure to alter that. And here you have a graph where it's showing you how as right atrial pressure increases, this produces a back pressure to venous return. And it doesn't take much. And the, the greatest change is at the lowest pressure. So when you go from zero to one millimeter of mercury, you have a reduction of 14% in venous return. So that is significant. And we have to think about what happens when we move to positive pressure ventilation, right? So you've got, you've got these two pumps working. So the job of the muscular pump is to move the blood back to the large, uh, the large veins inside the, inside the, the torso. And then the, the, aim, the job of the respiratory pump is to shift that blood to the right atrium. And it does this. As you breathe, as you breathe in, the diaphragm contracts and flattens and raises the intra-abdominal pressure, simultaneously lowering the intrathoracic pressure. And blood flows into the right atrium. And then on expiration, that's reversed. So this is a pump. It's a low-pressure pump. And this pump, pump and, and, and this uh, respiratory pump is ensuring that your cardiac art, your venous return is maintained cardiac output is maintained. So, what do we do when we RSI and positive pressure ventilate, right? Well, we disconnect that respiratory pump. So, the, 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 the positive pressure ventilation increases right atrial pressure, which decreases um, uh, venous return, which drops cardiac output. And there, there is almost no way to get around this, okay? Not only that, we disconnect the muscular pump because we paralyze our patients. And then also, we decrease vascular resistance. So we make, basically make the container bigger. So there are, there are multiple serious problems. All of this is pretty much undisputed and pretty well described and well known. So what are we doing? So if we go back to this curve, which we really like it for, for explaining what's going on, when you RSI and you positive pressure ventilate somebody, you are shifting them the wrong way. We want to be going right, and you are moving them left. You are not buying them time you're moving them closer to disaster. Now, right, just like when we're talking about bleeding our patients, if they are not too bad, right, they will survive. They will survive this. But if they are over here, right, where our shock patients are, it's, it's frequently and most often catastrophic. So, let's look at the evidence, right? So, this is a paper. Um, uh, David Lockie's spoken yet uh, um, at this conference. Survival and trauma patients that have pre-hospital tracheal intubation without anesthesia or muscle relaxants observational study. Right? 486 trauma patients intubated without drugs who were not in cardiac arrest. One survived. Okay. That is a, that is a mortality rate of 99.8%. Number needed to harm is one. Right? So... Not very good. So it turns out, right, that in our critically ill patients, right, they just don't survive. They just don't survive. And we know, so, so some people say, well, well, then we've got to use some drugs. But everybody knows that the sicker the patients are, the more dangerous the drugs are. 
That's why a lot of these patients were intubated with, uh, with no drugs. So you get caught in that loop and you can't escape it, right? So very, very bad for our most seriously injured trauma patients. So then this, right? Pre-hospital tracheal intubation. Passive pressure ventilation is associated with hypertension, decrease in survival in, in hypovolemic trauma patients, right? So look at this. Um, what they showed, right, that uh, de showed decreased survival, and then they, they correlated this directly to positive pressure ventilation. So is this all high-quality evidence? No, right? But it's, we have to look for, we've looked at the physiology and understanding of it, and now we have to look, and I think that there is significant trends in this data, and it's not looking good for for uh, RSI and positive pressure ventilation. Okay, so um, one quarter, one quarter of emergency RSIs have a hypertensive e episode. This is normovolemic. So you can imagine if you've got normovolemic patients and one quarter of them are having hypertensive episodes that's harming them, imagine the seriously injured non-normovolemic or hypovolemic patients and what the outcome is. Factors associated with occurrence of cardiac arrest after emergency tracheal intubation in the emergency department. If, you're, you have a, if you have a systolic blood pressure right, equal to or less than 90, you, you have a statistically significant chance of going into cardiac arrest when you're intubated. Oh, and what's the target for your, for your hypertensive resuscitation? Right, so you can't have both here. You just can't have both. It's, you know? Right, so this systemic review. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis comparing mortality and pre-hospital tracheal intubation to emergency, and it showed worse, worse for pre-hospital intubation. So this is our highest level of evidence if you grade evidence meta-analysis, especially with, uh, uh, or um, systematic review with, uh, with, with, with meta-analysis, the highest level of evidence. The problem with this paper is that the authors graded this evidence as very poor and the, and the, and the chance of there being bias is very high. So it's a meta-analysis of poor evidence. But, you know, the take-home message from here is, is, is the authors include the sentence, which I think is very pertinent. Cardiovascular collapse in an, is a known complication of uh, tracheal intubation in this patient group. Some centers deliberately postpone intubation. And uh, I would argue that those centers that deliberately postpone intubation can only be optimizing their patient outcome. And then... So this is um, uh, Tony Hudson's paper, along with uh, some of the people that have spoken here already. Airway and ventilation management strategies and hemorrhagic shock, to tube or not to tube, that is the question. And this is taken from their uh, conclusion where they, they outline some of the potentially harmful effects that I've spoken about and um, the, benefit, the benefit of maintaining a spontaneous breathing patient. Delayed intubation should be strongly recommended. Delayed till when? Well, if you can, delayed to the point of surgery. And we know this, right? So there are, there are loads uh, of people that, uh, not like me, that work in OR, and they say, like, if they're getting a AAA, um, like, they will absolutely not, not uh, you know, put them under anesthesia until the surgeon is standing there, and then it's like a countdown, because they know that as they RSI, these, or as they anesthetize these patients, they often just arrest. So, you know, this is, this is uh, not really new. So, so that's the evidence as it is. Um, it's not particularly brilliant evidence, so that's why we have to rely on all of the other circles of the Venn diagram here. Yeah. So, experience, right? Environmental complexity. As we move further from the OR towards the point of injury, right, we have an increase in environmental complexity. So it goes here along. So, you know, you've got the OR, You've got the ER, you've got the ambulance or maybe HEMS, and then in the military, you've got maybe an even more challenging environment, and then it ends up, you know, right up the pointy end. I don't know how many guys have been there, but it's not much fun. And, um, I, you know, I think that this is, once again, this is an axiomatic statement, that where we have increasing environmental complexity, right, we've got to decrease the technical and cognitive complexity. If we want to have successful procedures and successful outcomes. And I think that, I believe that that is axiomatic. And that's my experience, certainly. When you, when you bring complexity into complex environments, the outcome is almost always bad. So, adverse effects. <sighs> Loss of global awareness and fixation error. 
And I mean, you know, this is, this is, anybody who works for a hospital, it's such a problem to try to deal with. And so this also depends on the n amount of resources that you have. So if you can come with, you know, two anaesthetists, seven paramedics, 20 firemen or whatever, then, then maybe you have enough to deal with this. But, you know, the, 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 the less resources, the less chance you're going to be effective. Prolonged on-scene times. So our trauma patients, the shorter the time from point of injury to surgical control of hemorrhage determines outcome. And we often have very long on-scene times, particularly with difficult uh, access and difficult intubations. So that's pretty bad. Um, complex decision-making, right? It's very resource-intensive. We get difficult and failed intubations. Uh, not, not intubating on first pass, going down, you know, difficult airway uh, or failed intubation paradigms. Hyperventilation. Because if you just want physician, who's doing the, the ventilation and how trained are they? And in a high-stress environment, hyperventilation is almost consistent unless you're using a timing device. And I don't trust anyone, and I, even a consultant anesthetist in a highly stressful pre-hospital environment, to not hyperventilate. And that hyperventilation and breath stacking is lethal to these, um, to these uh, hypervolemic patients. You increase the chance of tension pneumothorax, right? And then you've got your... You've got your three H's or Scott Weingart's um, uh, hop killers, right? And we end up with this, right? This, these nine letters that seem to somehow always be put together, right? And even if you are a Jedi master of uh, anesthesia and, uh, and intubation, you cannot avoid the physiological soliloquy of your intervention. Right. And uh, there are some absolute experts here, and I appreciate that in their hands and in a high resource environment, this, you know, it, you may have a slightly better outcome, but that is absolutely not the case in the rest of the world. So, the reality, can you play that, please? Oh, yeah. no, you have to go ba uh, back, and then you have to wiggle the, you have to wiggle the mouse up. Yeah, yeah, almost. And then click on the little arrow. There we go. Right. Now, I'd like to say that I'm not picking on these physicians, uh, on these uh, clinicians. They are there. They're doing their very best to try and help somebody who's critically injured. And, uh, you know, and it, it turns out it's a, it's a young 17 year old boy that's fallen through glass and he is bleeding to death. So the, the, yeah, next one. There we go. Right. So the decision is made what they're going to do. So the decision is made. His uh, conscious uh, level of consciousness is dropping, so they decide to RSI him and positive pressure ventilate. And then unsurprisingly, next one. No, no, next one. Can you do the, the, the last one on the right? No output. Okay, we have to start CPR. Right, so a lot of people will say, this is inevitable. This patient was going to die anyway at not survivable injuries. Yes, that may be true, but the procedure that was done did not help that patient. That pushed them closer towards shuffling off this mortal coil, right? And that's not our job, right? They've got a word for that. That's called euthanasia, right? That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to buy a patient's time, and certainly no time was bought for that patient, and this happens more frequently. And then, very interestingly, these guys are, are omitted from a lot of the studies. Right? These guys that are RSI, positive pressure ventilated, going to arrest, they go, no, that's going to confound our numbers, going to confound our data. So, so, this, so they omit them. So in that meta-analysis, right, they omitted all the, all the, the, the pre-hospital cardiac arrests. So <laughs> kit dumps pretty important with... Um, you know, when, you, when you're doing your RSI. So I've come up with a new template, which I'll be selling soon. So um, I don't know if anybody, if there'll be any takers, if you're going to RSI and tube in, in uh, your cardiac arrest, um, in your hemorrhagic shock patient, uh, you might want to use that, that layout. And reason. What is killing my patient? You can't fix a C problem with a, a intervention that makes the C problem worse. Right, just on the chance that they may have an airway problem down the line. And there is no evidence that level of consciousness, right, 
is, is, is connected to, to outcome. There is no evidence for that. And if you want to look at that, just go down to Cardiff or anywhere in the UK, any one of the UK's large cities, to the drunk tanks right, over the weekend and look at the GCS of the average people in there and they almost all survive. Okay, so... So, if you arrive at a hypoglycemic patient, right, do you RSI them or do you give them sugar? Right? And if you arrive at a hypovolemic trauma patient, do you RSI them or do you give them blood? And I think it's a good question, right? So that's, that's reason, right? So in my estimation, looking at my little Venn diagram of my clinical judgment, right, I would say that um, the chances of this procedure being successful are limited unless we alter something, right? So what's the problem? Because right? al almost nobody stuck their hands up and said they would do it anyway, right? The problem is that it's in the guidelines, right? And lots of guidelines. I don't have time to trawl through them all, but, you know, um, uh, mandatory is the word that uh, European, European guidelines use. And then here's good old Scott Weingart's guideline for resuscitation. What's number one, right? Assess SpO2 and ventilation with a view to early intubation for, for, for massive hemorrhage, right? So... There's a, you know, there's, there's a bit of a problem here. So, um, somebody said this before, resuscitation before intubation. Right? So, 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 the message is getting out there. And I would say that RSI and positive pressure ventilation is a relative contraindication relative to the resuscitation. You have to resuscitate your patient to get them into the physiological condition such that they will survive your, uh, survive your intervention because that's how, that's how bad it is, right? So, so if we want to know how to resuscitate, that is what Gia's spoken about and Phil's spoken about already, and that's probably the best way to go, right? So this idea of a little bit of clear fluid, which we know makes patients worse and, uh, and uh, makes, all, makes the endotheliopathy worse, makes the, uh, um, the coagulopathy worse and vasopressors, which uh, you know, are shown to actually increase in end organ ischemia, you know, that's, that's probably not the way to go. So what is the way to go, right? <laughs> I think you, you, <laughs> you probably can tell by this point that we've got some kind of essential theme going, right? So it's, it's blood-based, blood-based resuscitation and with uh, whole blood as being probably the optimal. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's my talk. And, uh, you know, I would, I would like to conclude, oh, sorry, um, don't be blind to the hydrogenic pathology of your interventions. So, you know, I, um, um, David Lockie said, um, what, you know, why are we still justifying with this? Uh, why are we still justifying this? And I would counter that with, uh, it, that it's our job to justify things. And it's our job to use uh, good clinical judgment to decide whether or not we are doing harm. Because uh, that first rule of medicine of not doing harm is absolutely critical for us as physicians to ensure that uh, we optimize outcome for our patients. Thanks.